Please help me welcome to the stage Rohit Prasad. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. First, I want to say that we are collectively bringing and shaping the golden age of AI. I hope you share my optimism. With that, I want to start by saying that many of our AI dreams are inspired by science fiction. We grew up dreaming about jetpacks. We grew up dreaming about uh, spaceships, dreaming about stalking computers. Many of those dreams are becoming a reality. At Amazon, we are advancing AI in many different ways to bring new experiences to our customers. Our customers can go through a, a physical store with no checkout experience, thanks to AI. With Prime Air, we are bringing drone delivery to a reality. And equally importantly, all the underlying AI technology is being exposed as tools to developers worldwide through AWS so that you can build your AI applications with least amount of work and make your business be more productive. One of the dreams that's personally becoming a reality for me is the dream that was promised by Star Trek computers of being able to talk to machines. We have brought in ambient computing, which means you talk to the machines and your environment, either in form of devices, talk back with to you. This was brought to fruition in 2014, about exactly four years back with Amazon Echo, which was an AI-powered device with our AI called Alexa that you could simply talk to, the most natural means of communicating. It has revolutionized daily convenience. Our customers have a device for every situation. If you're a music enthusiast, you have a speaker that you can talk to. If you enjoy a lot of multimodal content, even want to watch videos on your device in your kitchen, you have the Echo Show. And now Alexa is available on the go. You can take it in your car with Echo Auto. We didn't stop there. Through Alexa voice services, Alexa is being integrated in many different devices. And there are 100 different device types where Alexa is already making different customers around the world be able to access and uh, access information, play their favorite content, even connect with people. Alexa is now in 80 plus countries. It has localized experiences in 14 of them, where Alexa just doesn't speak the language, but also is culturally right. It behaves authentically in those locales, and that is what's the big challenge where it's not just about the language, it's also about the culture, the local content, and understanding the local nuances. And Alexa is being able to do that. Our customers use Alexa in many different ways. There is essentially a skill for every occasion, every moment. Their days start with getting weather reports or traffic, but it can evolve throughout the day where you're controlling your smart appliances just through voice, or consuming different type of content in the evening, listening to your favorite books, or when you go to bed, setting your alarm for the next day. Alexa is part of our social fabric now. It also has the corniest jokes. And now it's collaborating with Jimmy Fallon to bring smiles to our customer faces. Alexa has 150,000 five stars reviews, and our customers love everything it does for them. Most importantly, it's also able to connect with your family members much easily with features like drop-in that let you communicate with your uh, family members who are at a distance by simply dropping in through voice, another magical feature. So let's go back in time a bit and figure out how did we end up here? So I believe if you look at every decade or so, there's a tectonic shift in how we intra interact with machines. It started in the 1970s with the character mode. In the 80s, we had the world of the GUI, where that's how we interacted with it. 90s brought the web, and the 2000s uh, brought in the smartphone. But then this happened. We had essentially an app for everything, and it became extremely hard to find what you needed 
to interact with a service, connect to people, or consume information. Your uh, benefit to clutter ratio on your home screen got really bad. Then, we thought about how we could revolutionize your daily convenience, keep the same benefits, and instead of having that clutter, each skill or a service that you want to interact with is only an utterance away. And that power was brought in by Amazon Echo, where you could interact through Alexa, cloud-based AI, simply through voice. When we launched Echo, we had to be great at four things. First and foremost was when customers address Echo as Alexa, the service they're trying to interact with, that wake word detection needs to be very high quality. Then the words spoken, uh, which express their intent, needs to be recognized with a high accuracy. Alexa then has to interpret those words in context and figure out what it should do that, uh, what should it do next, which is about natural language understanding. And ultimately, when it speaks back, Alexa must sound very natural, which we refer to as text-to-speech synthesis. All of these technologies, even in 2014, we were able to deliver high accuracy with pervasive use of deep learning, combined with large amount of data and massive resources in computing through AWS GPUs. Without those, we wouldn't be here. We also made a promise to our customers then. We said Alexa will get smarter as you use it. We have lived up to that promise, but now we are at an inflection point where Alexa needs to go well beyond all the, uh, well beyond the basic four technologies we talked about and focus on four different areas, just like humans. It needs to become more competent, which we refer to as the competency of the AI. It needs to become more context aware, just like us. It needs to be self-learning so that it doesn't rep uh, rely on all the supervised learning techniques that are super expensive. And ultimately, it's about naturalness. I'll start with competency first. When we launched Alexa in 2014, we had 13 very powerful skills, but it was just 13. Now, we have 50,000 plus skills available on Alexa for our customers. The way this has happened is by us working together with developers all around the world, by essentially democratizing conversational AI as we know it, through Alexa Skills Kit, a self-serve toolkit where you can build skills in minutes. Not only developers with software proficiency, but even end customers are able to build personalized skills now. While we were expanding the set of skills Alexa had, we, we were also looking at improving accuracy. In fact, at this range of things in voice user interface, even maintaining the accuracy would be a big deal. But over the past 12 months, we have cut the error rate for Alexa by more than 25% relative across all languages. In addition, an important aspect of competency is knowledge. Alexa has improved its factual knowledge where now it can answer questions more successfully by 30% more by leveraging a lot of knowledge sources that are available in the world and it will continue to get better. I want to talk about two things that has really brought this high accuracy for Alexa. We all know deep learning is, relies on a lot of data. And there are two things we've done here in an operationalized what was always in research labs. One is active learning, where Alexa posits itself what are the parts of the, uh, of the interaction that it has trouble with, and get human experts to label the data so that it can improve accuracy much faster. This has made us get the same accuracy improvements with almost 40x less data required for labeling. Huge advantage to make Alexa improve fast for our customers. The second one, which we as humans do very well, which is to transfer our learning from one task to the other, but has been a challenge with deep learning systems, and we have made this become real as well in a real production environment. We are rolling out for our third-party developer community in here, which is looking at custom skills. They build custom skills through Alexa Skills Kit. Imagine you're a, uh, a developer who's working on a recipe domain. 
And all the other domains that Alexa has learned from, a bi-directional long short term memory network can, that has been trained on that domains can be leveraged to transfer all the learnings that it has collected from these disparate heterogeneous domains to, and make your skill in the recipe domain work much better. We have observed more than 15% relative improvement with this technology, and the developers can uh, make, uh, take advantage of this without having to do anything at their end. All of this happens at the back end of the Alexa skills kit. We have, as humans, process a large amount of context every minute, every second, and make smart decisions, hopefully. And Alexa needs to do the same. First and foremost, which is extremely easy for us as humans to do, but daunting for AIs, is to maintain short-term context. Machines are great at long-term memory, but short-term context is a big challenge. What we have done here is that if you said an utterance like, what's the weather in Los Angeles, or LA in this case, and then said, what about tomorrow? Notice there are no pronoun references. So Alexa now figures out that there's a lot of ambiguity in this utterance, so I need to carry context from previous turns as to what was spoken earlier, and then merge what are the salient entities and the expressed intents or the actions Alexa take together to now change the hypothesis for this current utterance. And the way this happens is by, again, a dynamic learning and having long short-term memory networks make these decisions all in real time and make Alexa smarter. The same technology is being applied to understand multimodal context, like if you're interacting with a device with a screen, where you say, Alexa, order a blue shirt, and then you're browsing through to see the second one, where you have made no reference to where, what second one is. These are the kind of ambiguity Alexa is able to resolve through context. Another one is Whisper. This is a new mode we have enabled for Alexa, which we call as Whisper mode. As humans, when we walk in into a room and there's a baby sleeping, you just whisper and the other human whispers back. If you did that with Alexa a few months back, it would speak back at the volume that it, <laughs> that it heard, that was set to, not what, uh, how you modulated your speech. And the way this works is very simple. Let me show this to you. Rough day. What's for dinner? Shh. Alexa, open Domino's. Hi, welcome to Domino's. Would you like to place an order or track an order? So you get the basic idea here. <laughs> the way this happens is, again, with deep neural networks, that we are not hand coding by saying, when you, as a human, change your voice to whisper, where you change your prosodic pattern, there's no encoding of different features like pitch which by hand. Instead, the neural network, just by looking at the samples for whispered speech versus normal speech, trains itself and then figures out at runtime whether the speech was a whispered speech or not. Now, whispering back is also an, a pretty daunting challenge with, high act, uh, with a very natural whisper voice, as you heard with that. Even there, we are applying deep learning models to change the prosodic pattern of when we detect whispered speech. How should Alexa whisper back? Another form of context that, again, we as humans use a lot, but hard for AIs, is context beyond words. So far, I focused on verbal context or situational context, but this is where, now with a feature called Alexa Guard, you can say, Alexa, I'm leaving. And when you uh, utter those words, Alexa goes into a mode where it starts uh, detecting the salient sound events like smoke alarms and, uh, and glass breaking to keep your house safe. And this is all happening on the device. And then when Alexa listens, uh, detects these events, then it sends those audio files with just the snippets so that you can hear and make a decision whether something's going wrong with your house. Again, peace of mind, and this feature will be launching shortly. And here, again, we use the same similar technology, similar principle, where we train a classifier, in this case, again, an LSTM, which simultaneously makes decisions around whether you're hearing a smoke alarm or a, fire, uh, or a, or a glass breaking. And again, because we have to run it on the device with very limited resources on comp computation, 
we employ techniques like multitask learning so that we can have high accuracy and also keep our uh, footprint for memory and CPU fairly small. Another feature that again shows what AIs can do is we as humans have hunches. When I go to bed, often I feel like, oh, I'm, maybe I left the garage light open, uh, on, or a door open. And similar things Alexa is now able to do. So let's take a look. Alexa, wake me up at 6 a.m. Alarm set for 6 a.m. tomorrow. By the way, your living room light is on. Do you want me to turn it off? Yes. Okay. Again here, neural networks in the action where that decision was made by a classifier, feeling like, okay, you left something on. Do you want to turn it off? This kind of proactive but very useful behavior is a big deal for our customers. Alexa is also becoming self-learning. Again, this is an attribute we as humans learn a lot from experience, and we can't rely at this scale when we have millions and millions of customers on supervised learning because we should be able to learn from implicit and explicit feedback from customers. Let's take a look at this example, where imagine if you were, uh, you were a, a, a serious XM fan, you're driving or you're in your house, and you say, play serious XM chill. And let's say that doesn't work. And then, if you're a more serious user, you know that Sirius XM Chill is also referred to as channel 53. So in this case now, when you say channel 53, Alexa should be able to figure out Sirius XM Chill and channel 53 on Sirius XM are the same entity. And this kind of self-learning notice can happen without the, any human in the loop, Instead, just the customer speaking these two utterances, and then Alexa figuring out with customer behavior that there was a rephrasal or a barge in. And these are the implicit signals that make Alexa reformulate its interpretation so that it make, can make the uh, correct decision the next time around. So when the next time another customer or the same customer says, play Sirius XM chill, it will work. Again, with no human labeler in the loop at fixing this problem. Another big attribute for AI is to get better at. Very early, but we have taken the first strides with self-learning already. Alexa also needs to become much more natural. And here I want to emphasize naturalness for AI is not the same as naturalness for humans. The AI needs to be seamless when, uh, between a human-like naturalness when it's having a social conversation or when the other customer on the other end is uh, is being more conversational in how they are interacting versus when there is a task, where there is a task oriented dialogue where the customer has a clear goal and wants to accomplish the task with least amount of friction. There you need machine like efficiency. So we've taken several steps to make Alexa more natural. The first one is where Alexa can now do multi step requests in one shot. When you say play Sting, Alexa was already very good at. But let's take a, few look, uh, a look at a few of the things that we've done here to make Alexa even more natural. So if you, were, uh, if you use shopping list or to-do list of, uh, of Alexa, then you used to have to say each list item separately. Or if you said, play uh, Alexa, add peanut butter, jelly uh, to my shopping list, you'll see all of that in one item. So if you take it in your app, then you won't be able to check them off individually. Now it's able to parse these items all seamlessly Seems like an easy problem, but it is not, especially if you, think, if you think about it, peanut butter or peanuts and butter, you can easily make a mistake here in parsing these items. The same principle we are now applying, and you'll have this feature available shortly, is called multiple intents in one shot, where you can say, Alexa, play Hooty and the Blowfish and turn on my bedroom lights, all in one shot, again by dynamic parsing of the content and making smart decisions. We have a very unique challenge for naturalness because we have over 50,000 skills, as I mentioned earlier. You don't want it to be an experience where a customer has to remember the skill name. Instead, you want the Alexa to shift that cognitive burden where Alexa infers what the customer wants 
and figures out what's the best skill that, uh, that is relevant given the context she has so that she can make the right decision for the customer. So imagine the situation where you say, Alexa, get me a car. Oh, sorry for that. And, uh, and this is where you had to say, Alexa, ask Uber to get me a car. Uh, but now, you can just say, Alexa, get me a car, and notice there's ambiguity here. Are you looking for a toy car, or are you looking to uh, hail an Uber or any other ride-sharing uh, 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 service so that you can go from point A to point B? And this ambiguity, the way we solve it, that uh, our natural language and understanding layer is now running post what we call a skill shortlisting, where Alexa figures out, given this utterance, I should rank all the most likely relevant skills, and then, uh, depending on which skill is able to answer the query, I should be ranking what's the best skill to answer this query. In this case, it could be an Uber or Lyft. And then, based on customer preferences, it can make, again, a contextual decision of hailing an Uber or a Lyft. In this context, we are work Alexa is now working with several skills together that were developed by many different heterogeneous developers. But now we have taken this a step further, where Alexa is also working with other AIs. You can, on an Alexa device or an Echo device, say, Alexa, open Cortana. And similarly, on a Microsoft Surface, for instance, you can say, hey, Cortana, open Alexa. And each of these AIs summon each other, depending on the, uh, on the context and which device you're on. Looking at a bit of future now, if you think about where we are with conversational AI, it's still very early. And one of the things that I'm personally very fascinated about is can these AIs have a natural open domain conversation with, together with the task-oriented dialogues in a seamless fashion? And for this challenge, we have essentially started working together with academia two years back. And we started with what we call Alexa Prize, uh, which is a million dollar grant challenge for uh, able to build social bots that can converse coherently and engagingly with end customers for as long as 20 minutes. A very daunting challenge because 20 minutes, imagine walking into a bar and trying to have a conversation with a stranger for 20 minutes. Super hard. Last year, this competition was won by University of Washington. The grand challenge wasn't met. This year, I'm excited to announce that, uh, and we did this award ceremony yesterday, that University of California of Davis finished first, and they are here, so I want to congratulate them. <laughs> and, I, and also, second place was Czech Tech, and they were second place last year as well, so congratulations to them as well. <laughs> and Harriet Watt University has finished third, same as last year, so congratulations to them as well. Thank you very much for all your time. Now, I want to point out that this is a, uh, this is a uh, competition that's furthering conversational AI in many different ways, where we are moving into very higher levels of the AI stack, like reasoning and dialogue management and even self-learning. And in fact, this year, I saw uh, these bots trying to have more empathy and humor, which was just fascinating to me. So I hope you will encourage them uh, over time as well. Thank you so much on that. Uh, so let's take a look at the future. Let's imagine 2025. I'm pretty sure we'll have more than 75 billion connected devices based on different data points you see. It's unthinkable and unimaginable for me that at least half of the devices would not have AI. In fact, I postulate almost all of them will have some form of AI working on them. We'll be part of this connected world, and for this connected world, the cognitive overload that we have with the amount of services that we connect with every day devices we interact with, people we interact with, is just going to get higher and higher. So Alexa, in this context, needs to do a lot more, where it has to become more efficient in completing these complex tasks which are of high utility to our customers by figuring out and even planning how, uh, what the next step should be working together with customers. So if you said, what should I make for dinner, that's not an easy task either. Alexa should be able to enable that experience. If I ask for weather in Tahoe, if I live in San Francisco, I'm probably thinking of going there for the weekends. How can Alexa get more proactive, more intelligent in making me plan that weekend as seamlessly as possible? So these are the kind of experience I'm pretty sure 
Alexa will be able to deliver with time. I also want to note that I'm an optimist, and I believe AI can do a lot of good. And for inspiration, I want to play a video for you all uh, that I hope you'll, uh, will inspire you to do a lot of societal good and accentuate humanity as we know it. So let me, let's take a look. When we think about the real potential of what new technologies can do for our world, I have huge optimism. And I have to in this field. Thorn is a nonprofit, and we build new technologies to fight online child sexual abuse. On the same websites where you often see someone looking for a roommate, you selling your bike, you can go on and buy someone by the hour, and that someone may very well be a child. If we look just at the sheer scale of the problem, or how quickly it's growing, it can seem insurmountable at times. We're looking at 150,000 escort ads every single day. How do we sift through all of that? Manually could take months to collect the data that you need. Doing that with advanced technologies, you can get to the answer you're looking for within less than a minute. But what gets really exciting is when you deploy that algorithm to thousands of officers and they give the system feedback. And we, as a collective response unit, get smarter. That is a force to be reckoned with. I actually do believe we have an opportunity to eliminate child sexual abuse from the internet. And we will not do it without technology. And we will not do it without AI. The power of AI sits in all of our hands, and there are so many issues in our world today that deserve that type of ingenuity. Is it global warming? Is it curing cancer? What is it? You cannot beat being able to build and know at the end of the day, you are changing lives. One of our engineers, after he started working here, he said, the most gratifying moment of my career was when I got news that the code I had written had rescued a child. And that happened again and again and again. And it's helped identify over 10,000 children who've been trafficked. We're at a really amazing point in time right now. We know what is possible. It really lies within each creator out there. We have to believe that we, as a society, can do better. You just have to get started. Thank you, and keep dreaming, and we'll make the golden of age of AI become even better. Thank you so much for your time.